and say that it's hard to understand a moment in history when you're in it. It's, it's, hard, to, it's hard sometimes to feel the gravity of the moment, the, the essential nature of the moment. This movement that we are in, the Black Lives Matter movement, is our modern day civil rights movement. I did not know this. There is a wonderful, brilliant black woman from Los Angeles who is the co founder of the Black Lives Matter movement. She is helping us here in this city and around the country to make the most of this movement. She is my friend, she is my sister. And she's also one of the sweetest human beings you'll ever meet. Put your hands together and stand up, if you will, for Patrice Cullen and I think it was like six months ago, right, Melina and Jada, when the news media came to us and said, well, where's Black Lives Matter? And we said, we've been here. We said, where are you? debate with media that Black Lives Matter had fallen off, uh, that we weren't showing up for ourselves and the communities that are most brutalized by this country and by this government. And what we have to say to them is we are going to be here when Black Lives Matter is trendy and we are going to be here when Black Lives Matter is not. focus our efforts on the local, where the local fight is some of the most important fights, where people like Jada Raspberry who show up and survive six years of imprisonment and come down to the audience and says, join this movement, the movement that is about fighting for those most marginalized, not just in this country, but right here in Los Angeles County. We need all of y'all to show up. We need you to listen. And we need you to do the work. I want to talk to you for a few moments about Bernie Sanders. It's a different, it's a different kind of introduction. As a young student at the University of Chicago, he became the chairman of the university chapter of the Congress for Racial Equality. And Bernie merged that group with SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Listen, Bernie literally helped lead the first known sit-in in the city of Chicago, where 33 students, where 33 interracial students camped outside of the president's office of the University of Chicago, protesting segregated housing on campus. Before he ever ran for office, before he was a national figure, he was always a fighter. He has always rejected the status quo. He spoke out against apartheid in South Africa before it was popular. And today he speaks out against apartheid-like conditions in Palestine, even though it's to be a Democrat or a Republican. But he's still signing it. To, to do what Bernie did this morning, to he's stand still outside it. of Disneyland and tell the country that one in 10 of their workers has been homeless in the past two years. Yeah. Bernie told them to their face that two out of three of Disneyland's workers are food insecure. Yeah. That three out of four Disneyland workers don't even make enough money to afford basic needs, while their CEO literally makes hundreds of millions of dollars. I campaigned for Bernie to be president. I believe, I believe that he could beat Donald Trump, and I still believe he could. I'll 
close with this, I want to tell you that what touched me most about Bernie was on the campaign trail I saw with my own eyes his love and support of my dear friend, Erica Garner. so many people here today was forced into becoming a reluctant revolutionary freedom fighter after the NYPD murdered her father in cold blood. Now Erica, excuse my language, children, she had a bullshit radar. She could see BS coming from a mile away. So many politicians looked Erica in her face and lied to her over and over and over again, saying what they were going to do to bring her family justice. And Bernie, listen to me, Bernie was literally one of the only political leaders that she trusted. And she loved Bernie. And she gave her life, literally passing away this January, fighting for justice for her family. Please stand up. Just 
justice for all, which are very fine words. But what we are saying today is we want more than words. We want liberty and justice to be what this country is about. I think all of you know that today we don't have liberty and justice for all. We have one system of justice for the crooks on Wall Street whose greed and illegal behavior almost destroyed our entire economy and resulted in millions of people losing their jobs and their homes and their life savings. Correct me here, but I don't recall that one of those crooks went to jail. That's right. But then we have a different system of justice for a kid who smokes marijuana or another kid who steals a pair of sneakers. Yeah. We have one system of justice if you are white, and another system of justice if you are black or brown or Native American. <laughs> Bottom line is that we have a criminal justice system today, and you've heard all of these great speakers talking about it, that is dysfunctional, destructive of human life. And let us not forget that when one person is in jail, it is not only his or her life that is being impacted, it is the children they have. The wife or the husband, the mother or the father. The time is now for real criminal justice reform. And because of the people you have seen and heard today, all over this country, we are beginning to move in that direction. And here in California, this Tuesday, and in the coming years, you here in the largest state in America can help lead this country. And district attorneys and prosecutors who understand that their job is not just throwing people in jail, but fighting for justice. Let me just say a few words about some of the absurdities and the dysfunctionality of the system that we are experiencing today. And i got to tell you, five years ago, I did not know these things, like many Americans. But I'm learning, and I'm learning fast. <laughs> now, let's start off with this one. Today in America, as I mentioned, we have about 2 million people in jail. That is an incredibly large number. But of that 2 million people in jail, about approximately 400,000 of them are in jail for the crime of being poor. <laughs> not murder, not rape, not thievery. For the crime of being poor. Listen to this, and I know you've heard it. We have people by the tens and tens of thousands who are in jail today because they cannot afford cash bail. Now think about the insanity of it. You got somebody who is poor, maybe they have a minimum wage job, maybe they got an apartment, and they can't afford bail. They're not convicted of anything yet. They're charged with a crime. What happens when they are in jail is, of course, they're going to 
to lose their job. Of course they're going to lose their home. Maybe they'll lose their kids. How insane is that? And I think people don't know this. Some of us remember reading in Charles Dickens' books about dead of prisons. You remember that? Yep. Dead of prisons. Oh, that was terrible in the 1800s in England. Well, I got news for you. We got dead of prisons in the United States today. <laughs> Somebody gets stopped by a police officer for speeding. And they got a fine for a couple of hundred dollars, perhaps. Maybe they have a number of traffic tickets. They can't pay those tickets. They end up in jail. Ooh. Tens of thousands of Americans should not end up in jail because they can't pay a municipal fine. <laughs> Further, and I'm happy to say we're making progress on this issue because of the activism of all of you and activists all over this country. We have, as you know, had in this nation for the last 50 years or so a war on drugs. Well, let us call it as it is. The war on drugs has failed, and like every other war, it has destroyed a whole lot of lives. You have heroin, a killer drug, at the same schedule level as marijuana. Yeah. That's the bad news. I'm high right now. But the good news is <laughs> a states and cities all over this country are moving rapidly to either legalize marijuana or decriminalize marijuana. who are beginning to expunge the records of those people. And when we talk about the war on drugs and its destruction all across this country, let us be very aware that the war on drugs has been especially horrific to the African-American community. Yeah. Turns out that whites and blacks use marijuana at about equal levels, but blacks are almost four times as likely as whites to be arrested for possession. And I want you to think about what that means. I'm not suggesting that everybody who gets arrested for possession ends up in jail. That's not the case. But what does happen is you have a police record. So you are a kid. Suddenly you got a police record, and then you're going off for your job interview, and your employer says, hey, have you ever been arrested? He said, well, yes, I do, I have this record. And the employer may well say, well, we're really sorry, we have somebody else who can fill that job. How many young people have lost jobs or educational opportunities because of those records? So what we are doing now, because of your effort all across this country, we are making progress on ending this disastrous war on drugs. Now, I think it will shock nobody in this room to know that the vast majority of people in jail are not only poor, but many of them have limited education. The Literacy Project Foundation has found, for example, that fully 85% of juvenile offenders have trouble reading. Now, when they're talking about $3 billion 
uh, some channels here in LA and when all over this country people are talking about jails and incarceration, what I think is it makes a hell of a lot more sense to educate those kids. That's right. In fact, I think on average here in California, it costs twice as much money to put somebody in jail than to put them in the University of California. Yes. I think our choice is to demand not to spend three and a half billion on jails, but to spend that money on the children, on education. equally tragic. Everybody here knows, it's no great secret, that throughout this country we have a crisis with regard to mental health. We have a crisis with regard to alcohol addiction, heroin addiction, opioid addiction, and other addictions. What we as a nation have finally got to understand is that mental health and addiction these are health issues, not criminals. According to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, more than one-third of all prison inmates have been diagnosed with a mental health disorder including 66% of all female prisoners. Among those in jails, the numbers are even higher than that. What we need to do as a nation for so many reasons is to help people deal with addiction, help people deal with mental health problems, not lock them up. I've heard today, when we talk about criminal justice reform, that discussion must include police department reform. All of us want to live in safe communities. We want to keep dangerous people off of the streets. But what we want are police officers who are well trained, who are professionals, who are part of the community. And we do not want to continue to see, and you've heard the names mentioned tonight, those horrible, horrible videos of people being shot in the back or being murdered by police officers. That is unacceptable, and police officers who do that must be held accountable. It is a sad state of affairs when throughout this country, police officers end up spending more time learning how to use their weapons then they learn how to deal with mental illness or breaking up difficult situations. Yeah. Our goal as a nation, and being a cop is a hard job, let's be clear about that. We often have to make split second decisions. But our job is to have police departments all over this country have officers who are trained to understand that lethal force is the last response to Another issue, it seems to me to be of importance because it speaks to the character of a nation, 
and that is the United States of America must join virtually every other industrialized country on Earth in abolishing the death penalty. in California uh, at, an, at, an event, at an event sponsored by folks who were in opposition to the death penalty. And we saw up there on the stage a number of people who had been on death row and were exonerated. Can you imagine that? All over this country, we have people who are on death row, who are likely innocent of the crimes being charged. Our job right now is to say that violence and murder by the state is not a civilized form. <laughs> lastly, I think a lot of people may not be aware of this that when we talk about criminal justice reform, these, this reform has enormous political ramifications. Today, six million Americans have lost their right to vote because of felony disenfranchisement. A million and a half of them live in the state of Florida. And some of you may remember a little while ago that a presidential election was decided by a few hundred votes in Florida. In Florida, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Virginia, more than one in five African Americans are disenfranchised. Overall, one in 13 African American adults are disenfranchised in this country. Our brothers and sisters, we have to move forward aggressively, and I know that's what you're doing now, in dealing with this broken and dysfunctional system. Our job is to understand the causes of crime, which have everything to do with poverty and racism and lack of education. where we stand behind our children and our young people in making sure they have the kinds of lives they deserve and not locking them up. So I just want to, and again, I am very, very humbled by being with you today because I'm around people who have spent the better part of their lives, in some cases, dealing with this issue. And I just want to congratulate them. I know we have a very, very, very long way to go. But there is no question but that we are making progress on this issue. Our job is to continue to go forward. No more jails, no more incarceration. Let's educate our kids. Let's deal with our